All right, everyone, welcome to the 3D Motion Show live at NAB East, a.k.a. NAB New York. We are here accompanied by amazing artists showcasing how they use Cinema 4D within their workflow. And today we have another special guest all the way from up north, the great north in Toronto, Ingrid Barony. All right. Oh, everyone can hear me now. All right. So my name is Ingrid Barani, and I'm a junior medical animator at Red Nucleus in Toronto, Canada. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how I use Cinema 4D and Redshift procedurally to create some medical animations and illustrations. But before we get into all of that, I want to play you my demo reel with some of the work that I've been working on for the past two years. So without further ado, enjoy. <laughs> All right, so before I get into the whole demo part, I want to talk a little bit about what I do. So like I said, I'm a junior medical animator and I've been working at Red Nucleus for about a year and a half now, where I actually started off as an intern while I was finishing my master's of science in biomedical communications. If you don't know what the program is, um, it's essentially like medical animation and illustration. So it's everything with visualizing science. And before that, I actually received a Bachelor of Science from U of T. And so I have a science background, but I also have an art background. So I was able to combine both of them into what I do every day. Now, I know this path looks extremely linear, but let me tell you, it wasn't like this at all. Um, I actually, I was always into art, but having gone to undergrad and studied science, I was always looking for a way to leverage my artistic creativity into what I do. And so I was very fortunate to find out about one of these graduate programs. And there's actually four of them in North America. There's three in the States and one in Canada. They're accredited biomedical communications program. And that way you're allowed to kind of do both art and science at the same time. And what do I do now in my role as a junior medical animator? I do a lot of different things and I'm so lucky that at Red Nucleus, I get to touch so many di different parts of the project. I get to work on storyboards, on style frames, on production and post-production all at the same time. Um, so that's really great. If I feel like I'm spending a little bit too much time in cinema, I get to take a step back, use a different part of my brain in the storyboarding phase. I get to draw out, I get to work on the storytelling, really think about the narrative and what I'm trying to communicate to my audience, whether that be a patient audience or healthcare professionals. Um, I also get to work on style frames, uh, which I would definitely say is my favorite part. You can kind of establish the look and feel. You can be really creative with the kind of look you're going for, the mood lighting, and do all of that. And it's kind of like you get to experiment, but you're not married to a certain style yet. And you get to be really collaborative with everyone. So that's definitely the best part. And in production, in cinema, I also work on some 3D modeling. I set up some low to medium complexity scenes with some animation, as well as lighting and texturing, as well as some motion graphics in After Effects. And then throw all of that into Premiere for some very basic video editing as well. But like I said, my favorite part is definitely bringing more of an editorial approach to scientific animation. I like to use vibrant colors. I like to think about the story I'm telling um, and make it really engaging. While I was interning at Red Nucleus, my job was to create a lot of short animations for social media for some different therapeutic awareness days. There was one like World Heart Day, like World Migraine Day, Sickle Cell Awareness Month, and all of these different um, diseases that you're trying to bring to light and tell other people about them to spread awareness. And so I like to bring kind of a lighthearted and more witty and playful approach to these really serious and debilitating diseases. 
in order to get the conversation going. Everyone sees something very engaging. They're like, oh, what's this? They read more about it. They share it with their friends. That conversation keeps going. So I like to bring in design. I like to bring in a little bit of editorial into the scientific animation world. And that's really what today's talk is going to be about. It's going to be about how I kind of balance both accuracy and aesthetics in medical animation, because as biomedical communicators, we have a huge responsibility over the images that we create. Our scientific images have a lot of power and influence over the way people see and understand science. So I feel like we have a responsibility to be very accurate, but at the same time, have some fun, um, you know, bring a cinematic aspect to it and show the unseeable, show what's inside. Um, so that's, I'll show you how I do that today and the different work that I do and sometimes when you need to be a little bit more accurate and sometimes when you can bend the rules and kind of exaggerate things and make it a little bit more cinematic. So to get into it, I'm going to show you how I did one of these kidney demos um, showing polycystic kidney disease. Um, and this one is mostly done with dynamic vertex maps and I like to work very procedurally when we're in the biomedical space and even animation in general, we have very quick turnaround times. And so this is a really great technique in order to keep things procedural. So you're not out there sculpting each individual cyst and the client comes back and tells you, I don't like the shape of that one. You have to redo it. And so if you could be procedural, then that is great. So I'll show you this one and I'll also show you how I did the redshift shader in this. Since um, I always find it interesting to see how people actually make the shaders. So I'll do that. Um, hopefully we'll get to this one. This is a sperm and cell animation as well. And I'll show you how I used a very basic character rig. I am by no means like a character rigger. Like I have very little experience, but I uh, was able to use it to drive the sperm uh, tail movement and then make it a little bit more scientifically accurate. So I'll show you how I get to that, which is really exciting. And the last demo I'm really hoping we'll get here too, but I'll show you how I use some particles with the redshift object tag to show um, antibodies being secreted from a plasma cell. So this is an example where we're on the molecular scale and this has to be a little bit more um, scientifically correct, but that's not to say any of the other examples aren't. Okay, so with that being said, let's go into cinema. Um, and in cinema, these are the kidneys. So this is the setup that we're going to get to. Essentially, it's a vertex map animating with a spherical field. But the really great thing about this setup is that the vertex map is all procedural and it's all done using different noises that I stacked on top of each other. And then you could take this vertex map, throw it into your shader, and that's what's going to drive the color variation as well. So it's a great alternative not to hate on, you know, sometimes I really like sculpting things as well and you can definitely get a lot more detail and precision and accuracy. But if you're looking for something quick and you know you got to get this done, this is a great setup that I've actually used in my workflow quite a lot. So we'll get to this. And before we actually do that, let me just turn everything off. I'll show you how I got my base kidney. I did everything in cinema. I used a sweep object with a circle and a spline for my uh, ureter over here. And I used a render instance for the second kidney in the back. But we're just going to start off with one of our kidneys. And you can tell this is a good starting point, but not what we're looking for. So I took these three different spheres that I created and I threw them into a volume mesher. We all love the volume mesher. Um, and I was able to get something that kind of looks like a kidney, but you know, it's, we're not there yet. Let's go into this mode. So with that, I connected my objects and I actually used some sculpting brushes just to get the overall shape. Um, and to do that, you can go into mesh, move, and brush. And I like to use this all the time. Like the brush is really great. Right now it's on smooth, so it's not doing too much. But I like to take the sphere, uh, smear, not sphere, and kind of you know, get my kidney, like get it a little bit more organic looking, spend some time, you know, get it to look pretty good. I'm not going to do all of that for you today because I could spend hours. So once you get your basic mesh or you can import a model, you know, you don't have to do it all in cinema. You can see that the actual polygons are a little bit wonky, like it's not going to work as well with the noise texture that we're doing. So the great thing about cinema is you can actually just remesh it. So let's just bring, this mouse is so sensitive, Whoop. okay. 
you can remesh it. Um, and when you do that, I think it just takes a t some time to load. You can see that the polygons are distributed quite evenly on the surface, and it's so much nicer to work with if you're uh, painting, and you know you can make it even less dense or more dense, like whatever you want to do. Um, so let's say I've perfected my kidney. I'm actually going to go ahead and delete that because I've got a kidney mesh that I've perfected, and I threw it into a subdivision surface to get it to be all nice and smooth. But let's say you're happy with that. This is what my kidney looks like. We've got a ureter coming out as well, but we're going to focus really on the kidney mesh. Um, once you're happy with that, this is where the magic really starts. So you want to go into, you want to make sure you're either in vertex mode or like uh, polygon mode. Otherwise, this won't work. But select set vertex weight, leave it at zero, and everything turns red. So great starting point. Um, now we're going to get that vertex map using some procedural noises. So before we do that, this is really important. You want to make sure you use fields and you check that on. I think everybody who makes a tutorial says that. And sometimes I forget and I'm like, it's not working. So once that's on, you'll see that this freeze layer is created, which means everything is red. And we can start applying and stacking different noises, getting that spherical field to animate. So let's grab a shader field. We love a shader field. And this is when we're going to stack different noises. I could go in here and create a noise, but I'm going to be a little bit more fancy for you guys today and show you two noises. Um, we can go in here and grab a noise, then go in here. And for this purpose, I found Veroni works pretty well. But you know, go ahead and experiment. And I want to get those cysts to be really big. And so I like to bring the scale up and play a little bit with the clipping value so that I can get some defined spheres on the surface. And now you can see because our kidney is quite low poly so that we could work a lot faster, um, it looks like this isn't that smooth. But the moment that you turn on subdivision surface and in your render, everything will be smooth. So don't worry too much about that. We're going to stick to having uh, pretty low geometry for this. So this is looking great, but you'll see once we get to displacing it on the surface that this is actually inverted. So I'm going to take a quick shortcut, and before we get th to that point, I want to make sure I don't run into that issue. So I just like to invert it, and there's a million ways you could actually do that, um, but this is the fastest one. And you'll see why this is important a lot later, and then you could just go ahead and tweak these. So great, we've got the basic sys, but now let's add another one. So back to shader, let's go into noise. Let's add more fine noise into this. Um, and again, we can use Veroni. This time, kind of scale it up just a little bit more, something like 200. And again, I'm going to go ahead and invert it. And you know, play with the clipping values. Right now, this doesn't look like a lot of texture. It's kind of like you can see kind of squares, and it doesn't look very organic. In all of the biomedical um, animations that we do, we like to make things look organic and soft and kind of like uh, diffuse looking and so you can do that a lot with just these different values i just want a little bit just a little bit and you can see that again they look like squares but not to worry one subdivision surface is turned on you just have some extra noise to it so great we're in here but now i don't see the noise that i worked so hard on before um, because they're not stacked yet so just like you know photoshop layers we all know layers we can go ahead and change this to screen and that way we have the other noise that we created kind of poking through just a little bit for more variation and in the finished product that i've created i could just show that to you right now you can see i have a lot of different noises that i've stacked and that's because i went in and i kept adding more and more but for this demo we'll stick to two i won't get too carried away all right, so we've got these two noises, and you can play around. Like um, I think overlay works fine, or I guess it doesn't work that fine because you don't really see it. So uh, screen was the route that I took to get here. So we've got a vertex map, but it's not really doing anything. Every if I exit out of this vertex map, everything is still very much flat. And so what I want to do is I want to add a displacer. Add that, and if you hit shift, it will become a child. Great. Um, so we've got a displacer, but now we want to connect the vertex map that we made with the displacer so that it actually protrudes out of the surface. And in order to do that, you can go into fields, and it's as easy as dropping it in. And you're like, whoa, I dropped it in, but nothing is actually happening yet. 
And the reason for that is you have to set, like, what is your displacer going to do? And in order to do that, you go into shader. And in the other examples, you can, like, set a displacer to noise. You could do all of these different things. But we're going to be quite boring and just set it to color and set it to white. So white will mean that it will actually protrude out of the surface, and then black will go in inside. And that's the reason that in our uh, vertex map, when we went to the shader field, remember when I inverted these colors and I told you that will become handy in the future? This is why it's handy, so that now the bumps protrude outwards. And if you wanted, let's say you had a different example and you wanted these bumps to go inwards for whatever you were doing, you can set the vertex, uh, sorry, the displacer in, instead of white, you can set it to black. So it looks nice when the subdivision <laughs> surface is on. It looks kind of janky right now, but we'll, we'll keep working at it. So we've got this and it's great. It looks sort of like a cystic kidney. We, so we can get more definition and kind of tweak and refine like how big the cysts are, where the fall off is and everything. But I want more drama. I want these to be protruding out of the surface even more. Okay, maybe not that much. Um, something like this is fine too because once you add the subdivision surface, it works. You can see like the creases of the kidney. But if you think that that's a little bit too much, you can always add a very handy smooth and if you hit shift it will become a child and you can put it underneath and now it smooths out all our, all our work so you know you can play around with the slider until you get something that isn't too crazy I tend to overdo it most of the time but so we have our kidney it's all cystic but let's say your animation like in my case you want to start off from healthy and move to a disease state very quickly which does, it's not how it happens in real life. It takes a little bit longer, but for the sake of our demonstration, we'll, uh, we're gonna do it very quickly. And so in our vertex map, it's just so handy. You can do so many things. And a lot of people were showing that in the talks. Um, you can go ahead and add a spherical field, but because I showed a spherical field, I'll be fancy and I'll add a linear field. But you know, spherical field, you could do that too. Um, and I like to just drag it down here. And you can see right now, it's not on the right axis. Like, it's not coming. It could come in from any way you want, but I want it to come from the top down. And so what I like to do is I like to just switch it over here. And you can see if I come in, it's kind of subtracting. Like, my healthy kidney is bigger than my diseased kidney. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's because you can go into fields and you can set... So in your displacer, you can set your vertex map to subtract. And I think it just needs to refresh in order to do that. And you could do the same thing in the actual linear field as um, in the shader field. Oh, right here, linear field. I want that to be subtract. And I don't want the displacer to be subtract. That will stay normal. So now we have our healthy kidney that is smaller and once it becomes cystic, it grows and it becomes bigger. So just in case you missed that, in the displacer, you want to leave your vertex map alone so that it can actually displace the surface. But if you go into the vertex map, you want to set your linear field that's affecting all of this to subtract. And if you're looking for the opposite effect, you can set it to a different mode. Um, you can set it to multiply, overlay, whatever. You can experiment. But in this case, subtract works really well. But I don't want it to animate from the bottom up, so let's actually flip that so that it's Y minus and it goes from top down. So we can go ahead and just add some keyframes as well, or at the front, in the coordinates in the Y axis, and then just jump a few frames and move this down. And now, if we actually press play, it will animate. It'll go from top to bottom, but like I said, if you use a spherical field, it can go from inside out. So this is fun, but it looks a little bit boring. And when things look boring, I just resort to the jiggle for some extra flair. And the placement of your jiggle is actually really important. If you put it above your displacer, which is an issue I ran into, I was like, why isn't it working? Just drag that below. And if you press play, you'll get some nice secondary animation with the jiggle. But clearly it looks like the kidney is a little bit too hollow. So you have to kind of tweak the settings, make the stiffness a little bit higher so that it doesn't look like it's, you know, flopping all over the place. Um, you can set the strength if you feel like it's too much, the drag, um, just kind of trial and error to see, you know, the kind of look that you're going for. And it helps make it 
have more of like an organic feel. Right. And it's very subtle, but it's there. Okay. All right, so this is the animation part of it, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and it's, again, like I said, a pretty easy setup with vertex maps. But the real power comes into actually doing all of the, um, the materials for it and how you can use these dynamic procedural vertex map maps in your Redshift shader. So let's just go into render cam for a second. And I set up a material for the purpose of today's talk. Uh, just to show you all of that. So let me just open it up. And it's in the older version, um, but the new version of Redshift will have all of these nodes as well. They'll just have the funky like little sphere that will tell you what all of these are. I don't have that for today's talk. So let me walk you through the shader. Um, I've set up these nodes so that I don't have to be searching for them, but essentially I have a material blender and our standard kidney shader. So this is just your maroon color for the kidney. You can go crazy and add some subsurface, but we don't want to slow down the machine today. Um, and then I've made another material for the cis. And this is just like an orangey, you'll see when the subsurface comes in, but it's essentially just like an orange kind of like pussy material. Um, it looks white right now, but there will be subsurface if we change the color to it. So I'm going to blend these two materials using a material blender, but I want a map for that, right? So I can hand paint a map, but we made a vertex map. So if you uh, type in C4D vertex map, you can go ahead and drag this handy guy over here. And then you'll see that dynamic vertex map come into your shader, which is amazing. I can't stress that enough. I've also plugged that into a ramp so that I have a little bit more control of the fall off of like where I want kind of like the cysts to end and where I want the actual kidney texture to be versus where I want like the cysts to be. And in my example, I have a lot of different color variation because I've created three different vertex maps that I've stacked together in the material blender. So if you want to do that at home, instead of just having two materials, I had the standard kidney and I made two more cyst materials in the same setup, just replicated a bunch of times. So that's great. Let's plug that into the material blender. We want the base material, base color. We'll plug that into the surface. Um, then we'll get our cis color. Like I said, we'll make that layer color one. And blend color is what will create that uh, mask. Ta-da. All right. So this is great to start. But you can see it looks a little bit like you know finicky. It doesn't look as smooth. No problem, you can turn the subdivision on and that will help it. And if you wanna um, make it even better, you can add a Redshift object tag to it as well um, and check on the tessellation so that it could smooth everything out. But we'll just keep going with this for now. And you can see that in this image, I have like some really nice kind of textures applied like in certain areas. It's not all over the place. There's subsurface in the cysts. The kidney material is a little bit different. It looks shiny in certain areas. Um, and so in order to get that, what you could do is the asset library. If you just go into window asset browser, you can, um, they have like textures built. If you don't know about this already, please go check it out. This changed my entire life, but they have uh, different surfaces you can look through. And I looked through Redshift and I just found like some cool noises, downloaded them and used them in my project instead of having to go online and spend hours getting carried away trying to find a texture. And so I have a, kind of like a leathery texture. I'll show you what that looks like applied to the surface for a roughness. And right, if you're looking at it, you're probably thinking, okay, that looks wrong. It looks stretched. It looks warped. Like she's trying to trick me into using this, but it's not going to work on my kidney because I haven't UV mapped it. And if I can avoid UV mapping as well, I will try to do that. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but in this case, I'd have to do it. But I'll show you a little bit of a trick um, to not have to UV map your object. You can set the projection, if you just hit on the material, you can change it to whatever like your object resembles. In this case, I was like, a kidney can looks like a cylinder. You know, we could go with that. And then your problems about the stretching will kind of be solved. But I also tricked you a little bit because I actually played around with the scale values too. If it was one to one, it would still look a little bit stretched. And so I kind of tweaked it so that the scale would be right after it was stretched. I always use this trick. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got our roughness. I put that into a ramp just to, black means very shiny, white means a little bit more matte. 
Um, so I didn't want it to be super shiny. I want that into my base kidney. So I went into reflection, reflection roughness, um, and made sure that that was on as well. Roughness, and then weight is all the way up. Okay, so that's our reflection roughness. But what I like to do is I like to take that kind of like as a mask and apply my bump only in certain areas so that you're not applying a bump uniformly across your entire um, object, especially if you're using like a procedural noise because then you can see the pattern and it kind of like, it doesn't look as nice. And so I have a bump. I can show you what that looks like. It's kind of like this leathery kind of texture. Obviously the kidney isn't a leathery texture, but I thought it worked in this case. So I took this material, I did the same trick. I made sure that it was cylindrical projection and set the scale the same as before. So it looks pretty good. I put that into a bump map, fed that into a bump blender. And this bump blender is going to go into geometry and bump input. Um, and let's actually put the output so you could see it. And I made sure that that mask that I made before was going into the bump weight. So now you can see that it's being applied a little bit here, but you don't see it in other areas. And if I go a little bit crazy and like, you know, change the height to something even higher, you'll see that even better. But you want to be subtle. Remember, be a little bit subtle with the bumps. Otherwise, it looks a little too forced. So you can see it's in some areas and then in some areas it's not. And if you didn't want this bump to be on the cis at all, you could use that vertex map that I was talking about before to be the mask of where it goes. So let's just bring that down a little bit. We don't want it to be that high up. Okay, so you're probably thinking these cysts don't look like cysts. They're white balls on the surface of the kidney. So let's get to those because we've been neglecting them a little bit. Um, and I wanted to show you how I generated like these kind of like the vasculature in the cyst, like a little bit of like blood vessels, but not too overpowering, just some nice uh, micro details on the surface as well. And I used another noise for that. I always like finding different noises and applying them in the biomedical space. And so I can show you what that looks like. This one is called SEMA. I really like using SEMA. I changed the scale. I made it a little bit bigger, played around with the clip until I got it to be sort of what I was looking for. And this isn't going to be applied on the whole surface, just a little bit in the cis. And so this, I put it into a ramp with these very subtle color variations so that I'm actually able to plug that into the subsurface and subsurface color. And now, if I show you the material, the cis won't look white anymore. <laughs> They'll have more of that like yellowy, orangey, like pussy look to them. And if we wait for it to render a little bit, you can see they're peeking through over here. And like I mentioned before, in the final product, I have different colors because I made three different vertex maps to be able to get these variations. So I just repeated these steps. And the really great thing about doing this, we can pause the render, is you only need one displacer and you can throw in as many vertex maps as you want in here. Unless you want like one displacer to be higher than the other, then you'll make two. But if you just want to throw in a bunch of them, you can put them in here. So that's a pretty quick setup. And in order to get my second kidney in the back, I had a kidney, a render instance, and I just threw in that, which made it very easy because if I was making a change to one kidney, I didn't have to like, you know, replicate that to the second one. It was already uh, doing that for me. So this is what I have for the kidney demo, which is great because we have so much time to move on to the sperm demo that I was talking about. So I want to show you what that looks like in the animation. You can see there's some sperm trying to penetrate our egg. And this is paying tribute to some of my embryology background. Um, I wanted to find sort of an easier way to get the sperm to move without having to get super, super technical and really into rigging. Um, and so we're, I'll show you how I achieved this look. Okay, so let me just open that up. Actually, let me just take a sip of water. All right, much better. Let's move into the sperm file. We don't need Redshift for this. Um, so I'll show you what the rig looks like. And you're probably thinking, that doesn't look like a sperm. It looks a little bit like a sperm, but it's kind of moving like a fish. And that's because I actually used the fish rig in order to get a basic movement of the tail. But as we know, this isn't anatomically correct. This is not how um, 
the sperm would actually be moving. The sperm has a very spastic kind of coil movement to it, especially when it's trying to burrow into the egg. And so I'll show you how I kind of hacked that to get the look that I was going for to be a little bit more accurate. But at the same time, um, I also wanted it to feel a little bit more cinematic because if you do look at movement of the sperm, it's very spastic, it's very hectic, it's not really fun to look at. It's kind of like, whoa, okay. So I wanted it to feel a little bit more cinematic as well. So I'll show you the basic sperm um, geometry that I made. We can go ahead and pause this. Again, I have a spline wrap, and I, there's a billion ways to do this. Um, I just took a cylinder, I spline wrapped it, and I was able to um, um, taper off the ends. I have a spline, I have a spline wrap, and then I have my cylinder. So it's a pretty basic setup to do that. And then for the actual head, um, I took a displacer with a noise. I always love doing that just to give it some bumpiness. And um, I also tapered it in the front. So once you have the sperm geometry, let's go into the sperm rig. And in order to get this rig, you can actually go into character and hit the character tab. So I can just hit character just to show you. I'm not going to actually rig it for you because I was very meticulous in where I placed it. But what you could do is you can, um, instead of setting it to advise, uh, advanced biped, you can set it to um, so many different things. I used the fish, like I said, and I made sure that my um, I was able to take the coordinates. Oh, and if this doesn't work, right, this always happens. You have to click this. And when you're building it, um, you have to like set the actual coordinates for it to actually work because then it'll be very small and it won't match the scale of yours. So let's just go ahead and delete that and do it one more time. So go into character, character, go into the fish, IK, display. I don't see where it is now to be able to... There's a checkbox that you have to tick and then you set your or own coordinates. Is it in basic? Oh, uh, auto size. It's in basic. I found it. So instead of relying on auto size, you actually want to uncheck that and you want to set the scale of your model to be the correct one that you're actually doing in the different units. Um, and so if you don't, ha you don't know how to do that, you can go into the coordinate manager and if you select your object, it will tell you like how big it is. So in um, the axis that I'm looking for, it's around 20, 95 centimeters. And I know it's huge, um, but compared to like a relative box. So it's, a sperm is not actually that big. <laughs> Don't worry. But so if you run into that problem, make sure you uncheck auto size, type in, you know, what you're looking for. And then once you go on your merry way to actually get everything, you'll see it comes in at the right scale. Then you can, you know, rotate it, adjust it, like move all the controllers into place and make sure that they all work. But I'm not going to bore you with moving controllers into place. So we're going to hack it and um, fast forward. So magically, I have my controllers into place right now. And the reason why I opted to go for this method um, is actually because you can control uh, Cinema 40 has an amazing tool that lets you uh, be able to control like the speed at which it's going, like the nose wiggle, like the tail wiggle. And so you have so much fine control over like how fast it's going without you having to sit there and rig it yourself. And I love that hack. So I opted for these values just to get a basic kind of start. But like I was telling you, this isn't very accurate. Like sperm don't really move exactly like this. Like I said, they burrow. And so what I did was I used a vibrate tag to enable the rotation on the uh, main controller, which is at the head. And I set that to 360 and found a frequency that didn't look a little bit too hectic. And so now it's actually rotating and coiling and swimming a little bit as well. But when you have so many of these sperm, this is um, close enough that it actually worked for this certain project. Again, if your client wants a little bit more control, they want to really mimic what that sperm looks like, you might have to take a different approach. So this is a pretty good setup, but you're probably wondering how did you get it in the cloner? How did you get the egg? Like, how did you get all of these things to work? And so let's skip forward to that part now. Um, what you could do, you actually have to put 
your sperm and your rig into a connect objects. So let me get a connect objects. And let me drag both of these guys into my connect objects. Um, and then I actually made, I made a render instance. And I threw my connect objects in the instance. So let's just call the sperm into the connect instance. So you can see that my connect instance isn't moving, but my, sorry, my connect objects is moving, but the instance of that connect objects is not moving. And there's a very simple fix now I know, but when I was playing around with it, I was like, I don't know how to get this to work. Um, and you have to just set it to render instance. And then your instance will actually work. And you're probably wondering why I'm doing all of these extra steps. And because in order to put it into a cl cloner, you can't just take your group that had the sperm animating. It won't actually work. So you do have to put a connect objects, put that into an instance. And now when I add a cloner and I put my instance into the cloner, it works. <laughs> and I don't have a static sperm. And you can see sort of where I'm going with this. I'm going to turn off all the controllers because there's too many of them and I'm overwhelmed. So there we go. We don't have to see those anymore. And we can switch to a nicer view uh, of the sperm. So great. Our cloner is actually working, but um, you know we need an egg for that to work. We got to clone around an egg. So for the sake of today's demonstration, I'll just use a very basic sphere, make that a lot bigger. Sperm are tiny in comparison to the egg. Um, we never use the standard. We use icosahedron, and I like to just up the segments. You don't really need to, but 32. That's great. OK, so we have our sphere. Let's call it an egg. Um, and then in the cloner, we don't want to clone against a grid. We want to clone against an object, and we can throw our egg in here. And we have some sperms cloned against an object, which is very exciting. We're getting somewhere. Um, this is a good start, but you know you want it to feel a little bit more random, a little bit more organic. So in order to do that, we can add literally a random <laughs> effector to it, um, and we can change the parameter. So we can change where the position is, kind of crank these values so that they're kind of spread out along the egg. Not like only one of them will actually penetrate through the egg. The rest are kind of like trying to get in there. But you can see that they're static and they look a little bit sad, you know, like they're not actually moving. Um, and in order to get them to move a little bit, I add another vibrate tag, but this time to the actual like sperm themselves and I change the position of it. So I do something, you know, we can move it in the X and Y axis. Um, okay, they're moving very fast right now. You know, we don't want them to move that fast. Just a little bit of motion back and forth. If you actually look in the animation, you know, some of them are like trying to get in. You know, they're going back, they're trying to get in, like, you know, they're trying to burrow. So there's a little bit more motion to it. They're not just static kind of spinning in space. And so you can see they're doing that, but I think they're not doing that enough. So let's make it even more obvious. And let's actually 300 frames is okay. We could do that. Um, and in order to get that randomness, what I like to do is I'll make actually three different instances with different vibrate tags that move at different frequencies. So you don't, they're all doing the same thing, like pulsing back and forth. And then that way you hide that uh, vibrate tag a little bit better. So let's move on to our other problem with this demo is that a lot of them are clipping. They're kind of going in. There's not enough of them. Um, and they're not really going around the egg like we want them to. And to solve that, if you hit this indexed button, it will actually distribute the sperm in a much better way so that they go around the egg as opposed to like not knowing how to um, be cloned around the egg. And I think, I think we need more, right? Let's add, let's go into our cloner and let's up the count something like 30, maybe 50. And this is a really great time that you can play around with the distribution just try not to crash your machine if you hit vertex, because then they'll clone on all the vertices. And if you have a lot of vertices, there'll be a lot. Like, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to crash the machine. So you can try, um, you know, at your own risk. You can do polygon center. Um, you could do surface. You could do volume. And if you do polygon center, you're probably thinking, where is the count? Like, if you're in um, surface mode, you can change the count of the sperm. 
But if you're in polygon center, that disappears and then you start to panic like I don't know where all my sperm went. And that's because now that's being controlled by the size of the egg. And so it's by the, the size of the egg and also like the, the radius. So if I do this 16, there'll be less. It's kind of backwards, right? Like it took me a while to understand. And so you can control it that way if you like the distribution, which just means you have to have a proxy egg to drive the sperm, and then you'll make your beautiful egg for the uh, appearance of the egg, which is what I did in the final pro pro product since I found the distribution looked a little bit better. But for the sake of this demonstration, let's not get too carried away with that. We can just leave it at surface. And we can you can see that it looks so much better in the other way, right? Like they kind of have a halo effect. Um, and to solve all of your clipping problems, again, we're not using dynamics for this, right? So inevitably, you just have to find the right numbers that don't let any of them like clip through the egg. And it does take a little bit of finessing just to make sure that there's enough space for it. Not like this guy is like clearly penetrating the egg. So we don't want that. Or maybe we do want that, right? Like fertilization. Okay. So we've got our sperm here. We can change the count. Um, and if, you, if that still bothers you, the other thing that I like to do is I just go into the seed and I keep flipping through it until like one of them doesn't bother me. But clearly they all have the same problem. So we really just have to make these values a lot higher. Right, so that gives you a pretty cool scene. So egg, um, and then let's just maybe up the count a little bit more something like that and of course they all have the same movement so like i said if you make three different like um sperm with different vibrate tags and if you go into that controller and you play around with the speed of each one they won't all look the same and you can throw those all into an instance inside of the cloner for different movement um, and then the, with the random, you know, you can change the rotation as well for a more organic feel. I don't know why I put 36. You could pick whatever numbers. And you can also change the scale so that, you know, they're not all the same. It's probably too much, 0 0.1, just something like that. So this is the basic setup that I have for the sperm actually um, trying to get in. You can see like there's some nice fluid movement um, and they're all kind of the tails are moving. This works really well for a still as well if you wanted to get just like that nice kind of motion of the tails and to get like a really dynamic shot with some nice bokeh on the background and some nice cinematic lighting like I have in this shot. And you can see for the egg, I animated the displacement as well just to give it a little bit more motion. Um, I added some particles in there for some extra funky effects and the sperm are kind of doing their thing. You can see it doesn't look as uniform in this. Okay, so I am looking at the time. I have 12 minutes left. So I think what I'll do for the final demo is I'll just sort of walk you through what I did and sort of building it instead of building it from scratch. And this is um, just antibodies being secreted from a plasma cell. And again, through the use of like exaggeration, we have our hero shot in the front over here that's a lot bigger in order to show the actual internal structure. And this is really where you, as a biomedical communicator, you know, you have um, a responsibility, like I said, to make sure that it's accurate, but you need to enhance certain things like the ratio of antibodies to plasma cells is crazy. Like there's so there's like thousands of antibodies being released by a plasma cell per second. So it's like, how do I actually show that, but still make it like cinematic in in a certain way. And so you can play with scale in order to exaggerate certain things like I did here in the foreground um, and all of that to get that look and feel that you're going for. And so for this setup, uh, I could just play the demo. I have my plasma cell and I have some emitters that are right now using um, just like a capsule, but through the actual redshift tag, if you add a redshift object tag to it, you can change these emitters to be anything you want. And so I had an object that was actually for the antibodies um, that you can see in the final look, the actual antibodies. But I didn't want cinema to have to calculate all of this geometry because it would hate me for trying to make it do that. And so I picked something that was a lot uh, lower poly. And in the emitter, um, it's a pretty basic setup as well. We can just go ahead and hide the plasma cell for now. Just play the emitter. I'm making it emit from sort of one um, area. I was able to change like the birth rate, the variation, the lifetime, 
This is like the very quick version of <laughs> using an emitter. Um, you know, you can play around with all of these yourself to get the look that you're going for. But the magic and how I got it to interact with the plasma cell without using dynamics, and you can use dynamics. Uh, it'll probably give you like, you know, a more realistic look, but I was looking for just like a quick way to kind of do it. And I did that with, let's just go ahead and pause it. Uh, I did that with a collision uh, underneath the plasma cells and you can drag your emitter in the colliders. So then it knows I have to interact with the geometry of these capsules, which is close enough to what an antibody structure would look like. Um, and then you are able to get that like surface deformation to look like it's actually being secreted from the plasma cell itself. So that's the setup. Again, I threw in a jiggle, a displacer, a smoothing. You can see we use these tools all the time. They really work and they're um, great to use. And I also used a vertex map to paint the nucleus of my plasma cell. So you can see how interchangeable these tools are once you get to know them. I also used a vibrate tag again, right? Like, can we see a pattern here? <laughs> Um, that's how I was able to achieve this really nice render with the antibody here in the surface, uh, in, in the foreground. So just before I wrap up the presentation, I just want to give some thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much to Maxon for giving me this opportunity to come and present when I was in grad school. And to this day, I still look at all of these tutorials and that's how I learned. That's how I know everything about cinema. Uh, thank you to Red Nucleus and all of my colleagues at Red Nucleus for being so supportive, so engaging, and just, you know, fostering a really creative space that lets you explore um, and learn different things. Thank you to my friends and family back home, and also to my mentor who actually taught me Cinema 4D, Adam. If you're watching this, thank you so much for all of your, uh, you know, help. So yeah, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please let me know. This was so much fun to present. <laughs> And I hope you actually learn something. Use the vibrate tag, you know? <laughs> All right. When in doubt, use the vibrate tag. Yeah, when in doubt, use the vibrate yeah. tag. <laughs> All right. Questions from the live audience. Great job, Ingrid. Thank Great you. Job. Your first presentation was My us first too. presentation, Nailed I know. It. Thanks Nailed so much. It. We got a question. Jay, you've been active. Good job, man. What, what, you, what you got? What's the question? That's okay. <laughs> no, you don't get to ask then. You're late. You got you know, to wait. No, go ahead. What you got? My texturing decisions. My texturing decisions. You already have. Yeah. That's actually a great question. So in the biomedical space, a lot of our things sadly just look like a bunch of blobs most of the time, especially if you're doing cellular stuff, which is great, which means you have a lot of freedom to pick different textures that you think like, you know, look realistic, but you can play around with a lot of noises. So if I wanted a very hyper-realistic texture in certain instances, if you have to make a model of the skeleton, obviously that has to be hyper-realistic. You have to UV unwrap it. You'll go into Photoshop, you'll paint it, you'll use sources like stone or concrete for bone and like, you know, get it to look like that. But if I'm working on cells or something that's a little bit more creative, I look through the Maxon noises to see if I can get away with like warping the scale or like uh, stretching it in certain ways. If not, I, I like to you know go to uh, find different things on Google, different images. The problem with that is there aren't a lot of texturing options um, right now for the biomedical space. Like there is like some brain, but if you want like a liver texture, like nobody made that, right? So you have to paint it yourself in Photoshop to get the color variation, or you use a bunch of ramps to do that. And I kind of just keep build. I do what I can in cinema, like as much as I can, I use the content, the asset browser, try to do as much as I can. And then I give up and then I go to Photoshop <laughs> if I want more detail. And sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I hope that answered your question. That was a great question. Thank you. Now, do you do you have libraries that you use of textures already pre-made, or are you, are you building a lot from scratch? Yeah. So um, the company that I work at has a huge texture. They've been around for so long that they have a library now. And sort of what I'll do is I'll scroll through, see if they have a texture. Like they have so many for sales now. Like we've been doing this for so long, um, and I like to go through there. But sometimes if they don't, and I make my own texture, I'll save it. Like for example, the bone. Uh, I made a skeleton, and like the bone textures, I'll save that so I can make my life easier next time and just tweak a few things. But yeah, that's what we use. Very cool, more questions in the back. Can, can you repeat the question a little bit louder? Just, yeah. Yeah, you can come up, that yeah. might be easier.
Yeah, I can definitely walk. Yeah, I know. Like, I I, I blew quickly. through that. I, I told you I wouldn't get. To, <laughs> I wouldn't have enough time. But I do this all the time. If you're using you expert, the oh, the question. Yeah. I totally ignored you. The <laughs> question is, could you just walk through how you use the Redshift object tag in the emitter to actually create the antibodies? As you can see here, I'm using a capsule as like a proxy object to get the deformation on my plasma cell. But in my render, I don't have an actual capsule. I have my antibodies. And so I use this all of the time, whether it be through X particles or any particle sim. The reason that I'm actually not just using like a point instance for my em emitter is because I do need some geometry to deform the surface of my plasma cell. I'll just go ahead and play that. Like I need some, if it was just a little tiny like instance in the emitter, it won't actually deform. And so I was using this as a proxy object, but I was like, you know what? I can throw in a redshift object tag and you can change it if, if I want it to be like sphere instances. Let's see if that will actually play in Redshift. You can change it so that they're spheres and not antibodies because that's a custom object that I made. Oh, it's not playing in Redshift. Is that on, on the plasma cell emitter? Oh, I don't have a material for it, so it's not going to show up. But the moment that I actually change it to my uh, custom objects, it will show up in the render view. You just have to add a material so that it knows like you know what it's going to be. Um, but yeah, I use this all the time, uh, whether it be through emitters or in X particles, and it really like makes it a lot faster too because it doesn't have to calculate the the geometry. And if I just show you here, like I have um, an antibody that I made. Maybe I can solo this using actual data, and you can see the ge the mesh is like pretty pretty thick, right? So if it had to um, calculate this every time it was displacing the surface of my plasma cell, it would hate me and it would never render. Um, and so I was able to use this through Redshift and getting this accurate data from the protein data bank of what an antibody structure actually looks like. And you can see that in the foreground here. But yeah, that, that was a great question. Thank you. Good question. All right, so we have another question from the interwebs. So Rui Yay, Rodriguez hello. wants to know um, backgrounds in medicine. So a little bit more on that. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so I, like you saw at the intro, I actually have, I studied um, immunology in undergrad. So I got a Bachelor of Science. And so my options were, as many people probably, you know, you want to go be a doctor, you want to go into pharmacy, you want to go into research, something along those lines. But a part of me was always looking for a way to be artistic, but I didn't want to go down just the art route. And so, um, like I said, there's a few different uh, biomedical communications programs that are master's programs that you can choose after. And you can go and study both art and science at the same time. And you don't need a science background to get into them. You would have to just have the prerequisite courses. Like there's a lot of my friends that had an art background that just did the science courses on the side and got in. I was the opposite. I had the science background and I did like the art on the side um, and was able to combine both of them. And that program was really great. It teaches you exactly how to do this. It teaches you when you need to be accurate. And so you're not you know, flipping the brain the wrong way and showing images that are not correct and everybody sees them and they're like, no, you know, they don't understand the way the brain works. So um, yeah, it'll teach you most of this. And it's a two year program. Uh, there's one in Toronto, there is one in Chicago, one in Baltimore at Hopkins and one in Georgia in the North America. Awesome. Thanks so much. I think that's all the questions that we have Thank from you. online. Stay tuned. Next up is going to be Corey Martin in about five minutes. So Thank you. Uh, if you <laughs> haven't, make sure you get your badge scanned, get registered, or if you're online at the 3D Motion Show, click sign up for your chance to win a Dell laptop or a SenseLab tablet next week. And we'll see you right after the break in five minutes with Corey Martin. Thank you. Yeah, great job.